biology students. Today we're going to be talking about speciation and tree thinking. So, how do new species arise or form? Well, first we have to define what a species is. It's going to be a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. That means that they can make babies and that the babies themselves can also make babies. That's pretty crazy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in class and why some examples are what we would think might be a species and might not be. Um, but speciation, which is our major focus of today, is the process of making a brand new species. And this occurs because there's been a lot of mutations and trait differences that have accumulated that make an original population of organisms now separate and now they can't interbreed. So this idea of no longer being able to make babies together because of a lot of differences is what makes a species form for the first time. So we will go over some examples of how this happens, but Darwin saw this for the very first time when he was on the Galapagos. He noticed that these finches, they all looked very different and they were eating different things. Because they were so different and eating different things and they had different shaped beaks, they became different species. But a lot of that was because they had these traits that were different because of lots of different mutations. And eventually they couldn't breed together. Let's figure out some reasons what of what would cause the no longer being able to breed together business. And so the ways and types of speciation, there's going to be this first category, which is called geographic isolation. And geographic isolation refers to when we have a population that was initially together, all right, and now that one population has split up because of some sort of geographic or physical barrier, whether it was a earthquake that caused a rift between the population or a flood that made a new river. The two populations over time, they were maybe in different environments and differences accumulate. Maybe these guys really start getting adapted to a darker environment than these guys. And then if they were ever put back together, they wouldn't be able to recognize each other or might just not want to breed. This is a real life example of when that happened. So a ton, ton, ton of years ago, right? Um, these two squirrels were separated and they live on either side of the Grand Canyon. And they actually look very different now, but they were originally one big population but now if we put these two squirrels together that have been separated for ages by a physical barrier the Grand Canyon they actually won't interbreed anymore and that is why we call them two different species another type of barrier that's non-physical is a behavioral barrier and we call that behavioral isolation we know that we as organisms to make offspring we are very social creatures and so are all sorts of creatures so if the two populations have different courtship behaviors that's going to separate the population so for instance these birds have mating calls and they depend on those mating calls and the way they look and the way they sound and the way they smell all those behavioral things will impact how well they'll mate with one another and if somehow those things changed whether it was songs or smells um, that could cause the population to no longer be able to reproduce with one another if there was a large group of them that no longer liked the song or liked the scent they would diverge into two different populations and two different species Another type of isolation is temporal, which stands for time isolation. That means for some reason or another, and it seems slightly behavioral, it's a very specific type of behavior, that organisms within the population, some of them start to try to reproduce at different times of day or different seasons. So for instance, robins they have a migration pattern to migrate south to warmer climates. If they stop doing that, right they would not find each other to mate so if somehow the seasonal pattern or the day time in which the organism comes out to breed changes that can cause the populations to no longer interact and maybe not breed with one another and as long as we have two components of that bigger population separating and acting different they'll form new populations and new species so our question is when this happens and they start to diverge how fast does this business happen does it happen really fast or does it happen slowly over time 
Well, we would really think it would happen really slowly, and we call that slowly a gradual change, and that's called gradualism. But what we actually see is this gradualism is not supported by evolutionary data. We see rocks forming for fossil evidence, and if it was gradual, we would see very slow change. But what we actually see is very quick changes in the fossil evidence. And so this is not supported. The actual thing that's supported is that we have punctuated fast change. This is supported. And then there will be some times with zero change, but when the change does occur, it occurs really fast. And so what I would suggest is drawing this diagram and showing really quick, rapid changes in the types of organisms that are out there. And this is because environmental change happens quickly. Sometimes there's a disturbance and the organisms will adapt pretty quickly and then there'll be nothing and then they'll change quickly and then there'll be nothing. So pretty interesting that it's punctuated. Let's see if you're getting it. Let's do a practice problem. So you don't need to write this, but this is something that could show up on a test or a quiz. Which graph best represents the pattern of evolutionary change in a species over a period of time according to the concept of punctuated equilibrium? Now remember, punctuated equilibrium was our fast, quick change. I often say it's the one that is most likely to look like a staircase. In this case, hopefully you got it right, it was D. So if it's going to be more helpful for you to draw an example of the picture for punctuated equilibrium, I would add that into your notes. All right, next, there are a couple different patterns of evolution. Sometimes we see organisms converging. Lines that converge are meeting up. This is when two or more unrelated species look start looking similar. This is our analogous organisms, our analogous structures. When they don't have a lot of common ancestry, but they start to form these characteristics that look similar. They look like they're analogies. So a bird and a mammal will both get these wings because wings help them in the environment of the air. But in reality, these guys are pretty distantly related. Their internal structures aren't very much the like. So convergence means very distantly related things start to look similar. Remember, that's like our word analogy analogous structures. Then there's divergent evolution. That's when different species, when related species become more divergent. So think about we had those Darwin's finches and they are all on different environments with different foods and their beaks slowly became more particular and adapted for whatever the food type that was on their island. We also see this with mammals. They will adapt to be in whatever type of environment they are more they are in at the time. We can also see that in lots of different scenarios. This is more like our homologous structure example. Last but not least, we can show a lot of these similarities in common ancestry through trees. We call that tree thinking, and there's two major types of these trees. They're called cladograms and the phylogenetic trees. A cladogram is a type of tree that will have the order of the branches showing common ancestry, but the lengths of the branches do not show time versus a phylogenetic tree will have branches where the closer the branches are together, the more closely related the organisms are, but these branches do represent time lengths. Making one of these is a little bit harder than making a cladogram, so we're mostly going to use cladograms in class. But the important thing is we can pick out the more closely they are on the branches, the more likely they have a common ancestor. So we're going to use that to our advantage when we're analyzing these different species and how they've speciated over time. So we will look for more similarities on a tree, and the more those similarities exist, the more likely the organisms will have common ancestry because they became new species more recently. And we refer to these characteristics we might look for as derived characteristics. They are traits, and this is one of our last vocab words of the day. They're traits that appear in later organisms, but not earlier ones. For instance, not all animals have backbones or a vertebrate. That wasn't something that was always there. For instance, jellyfish don't have backbones. All the organisms further up on this cladogram tree do have backbones. 
Sharks, though, do not have bones throughout their body other than their backbones. They're mostly cartilage. However, everything above this bony skeleton, note, which is a characteristic, all these things do. Does the fish have four limbs? No, it doesn't, which is why it's below the four limbs. Everything else does have four limbs, etc. Which of these things have hair? Only these two have hair, which is why this branch is off slightly different. So the way we read one of these is the more characteristics they have in common, the more likely they have a common ancestor. So the more close they are on the tree. We can also look at which of the different traits they have by looking at where the traits are listed. So let's do an example. Oops, I already answered the example by accident, but that's okay. Let's make sense of it. Which of the organisms has the most recent common ancestor to crocodiles? Well, I've told you it's dinosaurs and birds, I guess. But why? Well, they're more close on the tree. And they will have all of the following things in common. They'll have this weird sort of thing that we don't know. But did it matter to them whether or not we know it? No, it didn't matter. They have amniotic eggs. They have four limbs. They have bony skeletons. And they have vertebrates. They have a backbone, but they don't have hair, and that's okay because these guys are really close together, all right? They are somewhat close to rabbits, but not as close to them as dinosaurs and birds. Very interesting. So we'll practice this in class. Great job, guys.